Okay, so the recording has started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third day of Connecting Online, CO18. I want to remind you that we've been doing this for nine years. Connecting Online started in 2009, and I see our presenters there. Wonderful. So we're going to get started so we don't waste any time. All right, a little bit about our presenter. Uh, Nancy Zingron um, is a good friend and colleague. We met online and uh, we also met face to face. And I miss Nancy very much, so I invite her to these sessions so I could see her, <laughs> at least in the webcam. In any case, um, she has a PhD in psychology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She's also a research psychologist. She combines um, her fascination with exceptional experiences uh, and her passion for teaching. She's core adjunct professor of psychology in the School of Behavioral and Social Sciences at Northwestern University. And uh, she mentions me here, but that's our PLN. We learn from each other. And she says she's a member of uh, various teaching and learning networks on Moodle and was that she's a Moodle and was IQ facilitator, community and manager, and the curator of the Azire Library and Learning Center and the SL MOOC headquarters, which is going to change to something else. She'll be talking about that, both in Chelbo community and Second Life. Uh, she blogs on thinking about learning and uploads tutorials and other goodies, as she calls them, to her YouTube channel, Teaching and Learning Online. Her contributions to psychology with her colleague and husband, Dr. Carlos um, Alvarado, have appeared in such journals as the Australian Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, History of Psychiatry, and Imagination, Cognition, and Personality. She's also published on her experiences in Second Life in an article on June 2013 issue of the virtual education journal called Maggie Larimore and me. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce you to my dear friend and colleague. Let me get your PowerPoint presentation. Nancy. So here we go, giving you the webcam and editing rights and here you are now i get a chance to see you yeah <laughs> yay all right i'll put myself in the background well good morning everybody um uh and early afternoon for those of you who are in my time zone um i'm delighted to see you all here i've been following uh, the conference on YouTube rather than in real time because of teaching commitments. So um, uh, that's why you haven't seen me before today. I uh, originally put this together with the idea of reproducing a um, reproducing a uh, history talk that I did on virtual education, distance learning and online learning, just to show that there's a through line um, for virtual worlds from uh, the very first known, at least in the United States, uh, iteration of distance learning. But I also, as I was looking at uh, my slides and thinking about my talk and uh, wanting to uh, make something more practical and more practice oriented, I thought that it would be a good idea to have the uh, uh, PowerPoint for your uh, perusal later. And so I'll be sampling from the slides rather than going through every single point on the slides so that we can get to the fourth bit before the time is up, which is called the course syllabus expressing course details as a permanent exhibition. One of the things as we go along you'll see is that people like me who've been playing around in virtual worlds since uh, 2009 and Nellie earlier than me, of course, because uh, Nellie's always ahead of the curve. Um, is that these are very real to all of us uh, physical spaces even though they aren't even though they live on servers all over the world and they're basically a mixture of coding and images and um 
uh, kind of a video game on the fly that the users can change and um, modify for various purposes. It's still very physical um, in many ways. So today's talk, we're going to talk a little bit and quickly about distance education from postcards to the internet, the technology that set the scene for virtual worlds. And if you go out to the SL MOOC playlist, I have a link to that on Nellie Deutsch's uh, YouTube channel, you'll see my previous talk in which I go very, uh, very slowly over the same um, material in the first three sections of this talk and talk also about art and artistic techniques literature and so on that contributed as well to this notion of vir virtual worlds. And then we'll get to virtual worlds and education and learning and teaching in an immersive space, co-presence, being together in a room, however real or virtual it might be, with people from all over the world, as you know from these courses, um, from Nellie's work and the online stuff that she's uh, provided for us over the years, it's a very, uh, a very uh, real connection. There's a sense of really being in a room with people, and that's even more prominent in a virtual world. And then the final thing is the course syllabus expressing the course as a permanent ex exhibition. Um, just to show you how you can set up a class, get the information out to your students about your teachers and the presentations, and keep a record as well about what happened in that course. So let's uh, see if I can't get this more in frame. So this is a quote from uh, an author named Casey who wrote this uh, article in 2008, and it was about legitimacy, virtual worlds looking for legitimacy as a location for education. He quoted another gentleman who wrote about elements of dis distant education, so different types of distant education in 1988, long before there were virtual worlds and long before, um, not so long before the internet became a thing. <clears throat> and Keegan defined these uh, distance learning as having three principles, a quasi-permanent separation between the teacher and the student throughout the length of the learning process. Second, the influence of an educational organization, both in the planning and preparation of learning materials and in the provision of student services support services, and three, the use of technical media such as print, audio, video, or computer to unite teacher and learner to carry out the content of the course. If you go way back into the history of education in general, those kinds of technological um, uh, tools are different, the, you know, starting from a stick in the sand to slates and uh, uh, the magic lantern and all the way down to the kinds of technology that we use today. So uh, one of the things that I love about distance education history is that people always go back, in the Anglo-American world in any case, they go back to 1728 when a gentleman named Caleb Phillips placed an ad in the Boston Gazette offering shorthand courses via postcard. And the idea was you would write to him, sign up for his course, and he would send you a lesson on a postcard and you would work on the lesson and send your response back on a postcard and that was how the course would go and he had a, a price attached to this it was a regular a teaching business that this gentleman put together now he may well not have been the first even in the then uh, very young colonies of britain on this side of the atlantic but certainly this is one of the first uh, physical evidences that we have of someone who thought of doing distance education who was a, a shorthand teacher in a particular city and sought students that were not in his location. These, as time goes on, you see a lot of very practical, uh, 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 profession-oriented kinds of um, offerings. Uh, a lot of courses in Pittman shorthand in the UK and in the US. Um, but then universities began to get involved as well. Oxford University is the first one in the Anglo-American world that offered degrees at a distance in 1858, which is quite early. But you also see this hunger among the general populace 
for this type of education. In 1873, in the U.S., um, Anna Tickner Society to Encourage Studies at Home was founded, and by 1893, just 20, 20 years later, 10,000 members had joined. Now, that doesn't sound like a big number to us, but when you think about the population of the United States at the time, and how many, uh, how what percentage of that population was in fact literate, that's a pretty big number. It's uh, emotionally at least uh, uh, synonymous to how we feel about the numbers of people who are in virtual worlds today. The University of Chicago, which was a very new university in 1892, also began offering a distance only degree. As we go along here, we're going to take a look at different types of, um, I seem to have a, I seem to have a feather. <laughs> I don't know, um, Nelly, if I'm, um, if that's only me, or where do I pick up my pointer? It, Nan, you can, <laughs> yeah. um, it, it looks like a feather to you, but to us, uh, it's just a circle. Oh, lovely. Okay, yeah. well, so that's good enough for a pointer, eh? Well, you could, if you go into um, the pen, where it says uh, strokes, I think you can choose different. Highlighter, possibly? I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, highlighter does something else, but I think the feather is the right thing. That's... Okay, we'll see. You can we'll also see. draw with your feather. The idea is that you can make arrows with your feather. You can point oh. to things, make an arrow. Yeah. Cool. You can tell that I didn't I didn't uh, spend as much time on the practice class as I should have. In this slide what we're talking about is the is a little bit about the the difference in how things were presented. Um, in 1892, the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, used a pamphlet system. They would send pamphlets out to students who had signed up for the particular courses. In 1906, the University of Wisconsin started sending out recordings, sending lectures on uh, phonograph uh, records to its its uh, its group. And when you get down when you get down closer into the 20th century, people are beginning to use radios as well. This is a pretty nifty thing. This is a cabinet from 190, I think it was 19, 1906 or 1908 that I found. These cabinets were used in the 19th century um, for these huge metal discs that were punched to make music boxes. There's a wonderful music uh, box museum in Vermont that used to be here in North Carolina. And there were all these elaborate, beautiful cases that had these metal discs. And if you were a very wealthy person, you could own more than one of these metal discs and they would play these beautiful um, uh, musical arrangements. When uh, photograph records became a thing after the beginning of the 20th century, um, uh, they just took the, the guts out that produced the, uh, that ran those musical discs for the music boxes and put in a turntable at the top. So for a very long time, if you were looking for a, a photograph record player, you were looking for something that would be in one of these cabinets that had originally been designed um, for music boxes. So it was kind of a transitional machine. Now, it was astonishing that at that time they had begun to think about how all kinds of places in South Africa and in the UK and Europe and uh, and the US and so on, they had started to think about how do we get to groups of learners who are unable for one reason or another to get to the location of the course? How can we provide education for these individuals? As we get into the uh, mid, mid 20th century, you start to see um, a wider use of video conferencing and satellite networks, but before that, even when uh, at the very beginning of television, so we, so in the 1930s through the 1940s, before television became available to the public, there were universities and corporations and government agencies that would use closed circuit television to provide courses to students that were in a particular location, not too far away from the broadcasting booth. As you get into the era in which television is available, then you find uh, universities beginning to get television uh, broadcasting licenses to produce educational materials for distant learners. 
the bulk, the 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 backbone of these kinds of of uh, disseminations of teach of uh, knowledge and teaching content and doing assessment and all that still rested pretty much the same way as on the same type of technology as as was used in 1728 that is correspondence so you might get your textbook in the mail you would send your materials back to your professor in the mail you would receive your assessment in the mail but you'd sit down in your living room and watch on Saturday morning, say, um, uh, the lecture that was put together for your course, or sit down at your radio and listen to that teacher um, talking about the particular subject matter. So you would see things for both uh, uh, professional development, for um, uh, vocational development, and college courses that provided you with, with credit. In Chicago, I used to work at uh, Chicago, uh, the city colleges of Chicago, and they had an unusual campus um, that managed all of the various distance learning projects that were going on in the 1980s. And they used a variety of technology, but principally the radio and, and local public television in Chicago. Then in 1989, Tim Berners-Lee uh, proposed a file sharing system between university computers who were doing governmental work. And in 1991, this was pushed out to the public and the World Wide Web was born. So then you start seeing schools trying to figure out how we're going to give these, this educational content to people through the internet. Nellie was teaching online in computer-assisted uh, um, uh, uh, methodologies almost 10 minutes after I mean it feels like 10 minutes after um, there you go she well you started teaching in 87 but you once told me that in 91 I think 91 or 92 or 93 you started teaching computer assisted stuff um, and certainly has always been ahead of the curve so uh, and some of some of this uh, some of these uh, um, you know these were very slow very expensive connections with a limited uh, uh, with limited ways to present the material. This picture over here is a, a nineteen uh, mid nineteen nineties uh, server farm. These kinds of of installations supported something called the bulletin board system. So you would sign on on your home computer to a bulletin board system you'd pay three dollars a minute I said an hour last year when I gave this talk but it was three dollars a minute to uh, connect to these bulletin boards and there were discussion boards you could sign you could send a CV for a job in some cases depending on the company and how far along they'd gotten you could take a bit of a class you could maybe be um, in contact with the professor and you could download materials. But all of this took a great deal of time. I can remember going and making breakfast and coming back and the computer was still downloading some tiny little picture, um, but it was possible. And by 1995, which is very early in this trajectory, Pennsylvania State University professor Gerald Maddox was teaching a course called Commentary on Art. And as far as we know, this was the first university level course offered in the United States solely on the internet with no other technology involved. So nothing was happening in the mail or on the phone as a regular basis. The entire course was on um, on the internet and you took the course and interacted with the course materials and so on. So distance learning has been going on for a very long time, but it has also exploded over the last um, 20, 30 years. When we move from uh, Anna Tickner's Home Study Society, as I said, she got 10,000 members in a 20 year period, mostly people taking practical courses like uh, Pittman's shorthand. Then you've got uh, the Penn, Penn State offering free rural postal delivery uh, for its students to deliver courses and programs. Now, in, by 1997, their distance education program had 19,000 students. Again, this is mostly correspondence courses with that one wonderful uh, course that was solely on the internet. You flow all the way down this chart and you get to the bottom. And in, 29, in 2016, it was estimated that one in four college students are involved in distance education in the US. And that's more than 
eight million students. And in a recent, a uh, couple years ago, the New Horizons report mentioned that around half, and it's probably a lot more of college students are not only are taking distance education uh, courses while they're on campus in the dorms, taking on-site courses as well. And schools like Duke University, for instance, for instance, are very active in the Coursera movement with some of their best courses being offered on, on Coursera, which is a free, uh, not as free as it used to be, but a free uh, uh, course platform for universities and institutions that reaches hundreds of thousands of people around the world. But their on-campus students are watching the lectures and interacting with students and getting their assignments and assessments in the Coursera course and then meeting during the course time on campus to do active learning projects, to have discussion forums there, to figure out practical ways to take what they're learning and apply it to the needs of the community around them. So there's this wonderful mixture um, that makes the word flip classroom sound way too small for the change that's happening in um, all of education around us. I'm sorry about this. Uh, uh, my little uh, alien antenna here. I don't actually use um, don't actually use this uh, this headset for my sound. So let's go back and look at some of the some of the inf uh, some of the technology, and we're going to go through this quickly. Um, usually, I start with a uh, I start with a magic lantern or something else. But in the 19th century, 1840, Charles Wheatstone uh, invented the stereopticon and the st or stereoscope. The stereopticon um, would take a picture, divide it into two pieces, and then when you dump this little uh, photograph into this wooden uh, contraption you would see uh, the two, two identical photos, one with your left eye and the other with your right eye, and the way that vision works would push these together and you'd get a 3D image. And it was basically all the rage. I mean, if you watch movies about the 19th century, if they're not sitting watching a magic lantern, um, uh, which was actually invented a couple centuries before, uh, projecting shapes and, and uh, balls of light on the wall, they were passing around a stereopticon with a box of pictures. These kinds of things could also be used to deliver course material. When we get to the middle of the, of the 20th century, people are starting to think about how do I give people an immersive idea? Certainly we have these 3D glasses so you could see somebody flying at you really feel like it comes out of the screen. People were talking about putting uh, motion uh, motion machines underneath all of the chairs in a movie theater so you could get rolled around when something happened on the screen. Martin Helig in 1956 actually tried to put together something called the full body experience where you would sit in a chair, you'd put your hands, the chair was on hydraulics, you'd put your hands on the levers, you'd be immersed inside of this kind of um, a presenter and you would see your movies, you would see all these kinds of things through this full body experience. Never got picked up, never got adopted, I'm sure, because of the cost of putting all these things out there, not to mention uh, going to the movies is a very social experience and going to a big room and isolating yourself along with other people probably wasn't what people wanted to do. So it didn't, it didn't get picked up, but it was an excellent idea. In 1961, uh, e uh, Ivan Sutherland developed what's now called the heads-up display, but if you see this photo, what's really interesting about this guy here is that there was a machine behind him holding up this, this heads-up display that he was looking through to see things virtually, you know, to see a film or to become immersed in a 3D way with some kind of imagery. Um, and that was another idea. Well, this is going to, it's obviously a precursor of the virtual reality headsets that people have got out there today, but it was something that was very bulky and it was very heavy. And so it wasn't, it also wasn't adopted in anything other than um, engineering um, uh, adaptations and, and in university research and I'm sure military research as well. By eight, 1986, believe it or not, Lucasfilm and Quantum Link had made a, a, a computer game that had actually something to see. Now, prior to that, there were lots of these text-based games. I had a brother-in-law who was a um, 
uh, a computer tech at the time. And be, so he could do work from home for his clients. He had this monster console that looked like an enormous um, uh, um, architectural plan printer that sat in his front room and it had a little uh, case on it that you could stick a phone in and it made that horrible squealing noise when it went through the modem to the company and you would get a piece of paper that looked like a roll of butcher paper that would just suddenly type on itself and pop up so it was in it was just huge it took up the same amount of floor space in his living room as as his wife's uh, um, piano she had a, a stand-up piano rather than a um, like a grand piano, but it was literally a large console. But you could sit in front of it after hours and access a game that was on the back end of um, of the servers at the company that he worked for, and it would literally say things like, "Welcome to the castle. You are now at the door. Do you, op you know, open the door, or close the door? You could say what you wanted to do. You're in a dark alley. You do you want to go left? Do you want to go right? There's a sword on the floor. Do you want to pick it up?" not so on so you would interact with this game just with rows of text flying up on the screen but in 86 a lucasfilm came out with this uh, very kind of rudimentary little computer game and people were ecstatic now we've got a visual this is really exciting world chat came out in 1995 and that was really a social media platform and alpha worlds uh it came out in in 1995 as well as a way to interact with uh, a landscape and with other people and with activities and this is actually still there it's called active worlds and it's used for education. When you get down to 1998, in the summer of 1998, a group of USC students, so this is University of California in Santa Cruz, got together with an international set of collaborators to write the code and develop what was a, a university-based virtual world. Now this, this uh, graininess of this photo is not an indication of how bad my, my uh, computer is. Rather, this is what it looked like. So if you've ever seen, if you've seen into computer games in these days, or you've gone into virtual worlds, you know that things are crisp and beautiful and in high definition, and these virtual worlds are getting even better and better and better as they evolve a long time. But this was what it looked like then, and it was an extraordinary accomplishment. You had note cards that you could click on to get information about what was going on on the UNC campus. US, uh, UCSC campus. You could make a little avatar, not very attractive, but still an avatar who could move around in the area and take a look. Now, all of these retrieval, uh, retrieval notes that are on my uh, slides will take you to YouTube videos or articles about uh, the, the history of virtual worlds. And I am um, as Nellie is an evangelist for online education, I'm an evangelist for virtual world education, even though I'm more often in a WizIQ webinar than anywhere else. Um, and then Second Life came around, and there's a lot of really interesting history about Second Life. It was built by a, a technical company called Linden Laboratories, who's based in San Francisco and now has uh, installations all over the world. The the original company was making was doing data crunching and making um, uh, making products for for clients, and they set up a virtual world in two thousand and two purely for the idea of showing um, a concept that they were attempting to sell to individuals in other co other companies that they were trying to sell this particular product to. So they set up a virtual world so that they could meet in the virtual world with their customers from elsewhere on the planet and play with this product. Um, what happened was, once the demonstration was over, they discovered that their own employees and the employees of the customer were actually getting back into this little world and playing around and building things and talking to each other and so on. And it dawned on them that this is something that they could do as a product. They could provide this medium, this user built world and put it out on the internet and sell memberships and maybe that would work. And oh boy, has it ever. This is what the, uh, what the avatars look like at the very beginning and now they're pretty damn sophisticated pretty darn sophisticated sorry um, and this is the size of the the world in that in those early days now it's significantly larger so let's talk a little bit more about virtual worlds the, the key thing about a virtual world 
is how it speaks to Keegan's first rule, quasi-permanent separation between teacher and student. When you are in a virtual world with another individual who's running another avatar, you are in, a, in the same space. And emotionally, intellectually, cognitively, and in terms of your memories of the experience, you are co-present with that person. You are occupying the same spot. You can sit down together and your avatars can have a cup of coffee. You can check chat for a couple of hours, you can build together, you can learn together, and my favorite thing, you can dance together. This was the uh, one of the dances at the closing of last year's Second Life MOOC. This is a course that Nellie invented um, in 2014. It runs for about a month in Second Life and other virtual worlds. We bring in teachers and we uh, bring in speakers who are using virtual worlds for education from uh, language learning and in grade school uh, activities, physics, engineering, um, and teacher training, a librarianship, and so on, who come and give talks just as we're doing here, but in the virtual world. And there's always a dance or two. This is me, <laughs> this is one of our presenters. So let me go on to the next slide. And co-presence is the key. You really feel like you're there with the other people. Now, Second Life has had a lot of hype. People were saying this is the last thing. This is what education is going to be. We're all going to be in virtual worlds. Okay. So it got started with a lot of hype, and then it kind of crashed in the media. Everybody was writing articles a few years back about how virtual education is dead, and there's no reason to even think about it, and why are we even talking about it? Yeah, well, yesterday... <laughs> There were 51,823 people running avatars at noon in Second Life, and there are 53 million, almost 54 million residents still in Second Life um, at that time. The annual, uh, well, the, the quarterly, I think it's the last quarterly financial report I saw for the amount of money that tr changes hands in Second Life, because people will make little clothing and you buy that for a dollar for your for your avatar or you buy a building that somebody else made for five dollars for your school at those small transactions added up to well over 18 million dollars in u.s dollars over every quarter of every year uh, over the last several years so it's certainly not uh gone now the big universities and the big corporations who all ran in there and made huge replicas of their campuses and talked about how they were going to have conferences with everybody from their from their uh, multinational staff in Second Life and in virtual worlds of one sort or another. Many of those folks have decamped and they've decamped because of the cost of Second Life. Now there's lots of other uh, virtual worlds that are much less expensive. They've decamped to their own uh, server-based worlds that they use for their company at, in a proprietary manner. And they've gone on to virtual reality and to uh, uh, other kinds of online education. But there are so, there is so, there is still a very large core of people who are using uh, virtual worlds for especially education, art, and live music. Now, when you download this um, PowerPoint, you'll see this is the destination guide for Second Life that I picked up yesterday. Down here is the Karen Hope Center of Second Life. This woman um, is a University of Virginia PhD student in clinical psychology, and she runs a center for abused uh, women in, in my neighborhood. She's a tenant of mine. Um, and this is a marvelous center where people can come in and they're in self-help groups. They can get to um, uh, know each other. They can find resources and they can do this anonymously, completely anonymously. They present as an avatar that they've cho chosen um, and uh, their their privacy is protected. This is not the only type of intervention that's uh, uh, used in a virtual world, but this is one that that uh, that I know the person personally. She's, as I said, a tenant of mine in that space. Now, professional development takes place all the time in Second Life, and I have two more pictures on the next slide. But this is the calendar for this year's virtual worlds breast 
best practices in education conference, which takes place between the 15th and 17th of March this year, um, with things happening starting uh, March 4th and going on through uh, April. You can find the BWBPE uh, presentations from past years. The conference is in its 11th year, focusing on all kinds of virtual reality um, types of education. Um, you can find the calendar online at vwbpe.org. You can also find their YouTube channel and see presentations from previous worlds. Another one that's coming up is the Open Sim um, uh, Conference. It's OCCC, OSCC. That's coming up as well. You can find that on YouTube. And then there are, at the end of my presentation, there are links to all of the Second Life MOOC um, uh, playlists that are on Nellie Deutsch's channel. And these are our courses that go back to 2014. In 2014, I was a student and then I've been helping out um, as one of the co-organizers with Nellie and with Doris uh, Molero, who many of you probably know. Now, it, there is, I'm going to talk about the metaverse quickly in a second. The metaverse are all these other virtual worlds that live out there. The advantages of Second Life itself still are that it's easier onboarding for students. It's a much more mature um, uh, uh, second, uh, virtual world practice uh, platform in the sense that there's lots more th things to buy. There's lots more people there. There's They've gone through a long time of trying to help people get through that, learning how to run the place, learning how to get the skills that you need. They've been at this for um, you know, 14, 16 years. So there's easier onboarding for the students and for the teachers as well. And more examples on what you can do. This is a virtual worlds education roundtable, which is a weekly discussion forum that's been going on for eight years. This is the International Society for uh, Technology and Education and their virtual environments program. And when I talk about the metaverse, I talk about the more than a hundred other virtual worlds that are public out in the world. There are also oodles and oodles, so many private ones as well. This one is Great Canada Grid. This one is DigiWorlds. This is an installation called Escape, uh, where uh, Spanish language learning is taking place. And this is my little library in DigiWorlds that I'm building. I'm doing uh, building a world full of gardens of, of libraries. So you click on all of these things and it takes you through to the books and gives you information about them. So the advantages are that you you can read through this later also is that your social, uh, the primary advantage is that your social distance is both close and far. You're close enough for real world, real bonds to form, um, far enough away to retreat when you're threatened. You can manage your social encounters to fit inter interactional and collaborative skills and you can take a lot of, of courses here and the things that you learn because experience is experience translate to the real world. World. So let's take a look at what we can do. Now, once again, um, take a look at the take a look at the at the uh, 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 PowerPoint in the classroom for more information and for all of these links. This is the Northern Illinois, Northern uh, Virginia Community College uh, Sim. They teach geology on their Grand Canyon set. They also teach uh, Chinese in a beautiful little Chinese town. They teach neurophysiology and neuroanatomy in a large brain um, that's up in the air and you go up in there and you learn about it. This is from Hong Kong University, a man named uh, uh, Brent Newsom, Newsom, and we're going to talk about him in a second. Um, and this is from several of his uh, installations. This one was a walking tour through uh, Charles Dickens's The Christmas Carol, and you interact with the individuals and you go through all the steps of the story. So it's a way of teaching literature. Now, one of the big things about uh, uh, Second Life and other virtual worlds is that these are permanent places. As long as the company doesn't go belly up and you've got the land that you're renting, you've got something that you can put together and have from year to year. When you first start putting out a syllabus or an installation for a course, it takes a lot of time. You've got to build certain things. You can buy things. You can get people to help you and so on. But once it's there, it's up and can be modified. All of these images were created in PowerPoints and saved as an image 
each PowerPoint screen saved as an image and then uploaded to what looks like a little bitty box. And you can get a free uh, script that you can put in this little bitty box that puts a frame around it and allows you to put information in it so that when someone walks in, they can click on that bitty box and they can get all that information. And I'll show you what that looks like. This is how we do our syllabus. This is last year's syllabus. So each one of these little boards represents an individual course or activity in the class as a whole. And this is a great class. We really enjoy this. It has a Moodle base because it's, a, it's Nellie's course and it has a lot of other wonderful things that um, you can do in World and that you can do in the Moodle without being able to get in because obviously one of the disadvantages of virtual worlds is that they, they put a strain on your computer and there are always people who are interested in this type of education but can't really get there um, physically from their own situation. Their broadband's not good enough, their computer's not good enough, they just don't have the money to spare for that. So we, we have uh, students both in Moodle and in Second Life. The ones who are in Second Life can come in here to the syllabus and click on any one of these activities and get all the information they need. And down here are little boxes that give them other, other information, like how to get to a particular place or a tour of the area or something. So this is, this is Brant Noonson's uh, particular talk from last year. He's from Hong Kong University, and he, he uh, not only teaches IT courses, but he also develops all of these gamification um, installations for different uh, departments in the university. So this little board shows the information about his course, and I've got his picture up here, and now, of course, I have a PowerPoint I can edit every year and plop in a new person's stuff and um, put the put the uh, name of the title, the name of the uh, course on, and also um, the information. I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. I have so much. <laughs> We're almost to the end here. So this is one of the things that I really wanted to focus on. This little board. When you click on this little board, it brings up this little guy over here and says, "Do you want to keep a subdirectory in your inventory?" In virtual worlds, you'll have an inventory, and in the inventory, you can keep images and clothes and objects and note cards and all kinds of information. Um, and you say yes, and it opens up in your inventory. And it, when you click on the little downward facing arrow on the name of your folder, it will show you everything that's in the folder. So he provided us not only with his biography on a Word doc that I could copy and paste into one of these cute little note, note, uh, note cards, this is his biography, he also provided us with landmarks, that's what these are. Those are physical locations inside of the virtual world. You click on that landmark and you are immediately teleported to that location to go through whatever educational activity you're gonna go through. I can't tell you how wonderful that is for my Spanish class that I'm taking because I can do my homework right up until a second before the class starts and hit the teleport button and be in my chair as the teacher is coming through the door. So he gave us that. We put all of that in a note card so people could come later and pick this up and go and see these installations. We also have a note card that gives information about the course, where it's taking place, what it's about. Initially, it would have had the landmark here. Later on, it has the landmark and the YouTube link. It also has links to the course information like the Google Calendar, the Moodle, and all that stuff. So you have all of this information that you can pop into this little board. And when the course is over, you can edit it so that people can come in six months later, eight months later, nine months later, click on everything they need to click on, go and see that installation if it's still there, go out and see the YouTube channel, and so on. And we have a number of students every year who become our students because they wandered into the integrity, uh, integrating technology building, which is Nellie's building in the neighborhood, and walked around that room and clicked on everything. That's always a rule in virtual worlds, click on everything. Now this is the second floor of that same building. And what I do at the end of every year is just move all of the wall boards up to the next floor. The third floor has the, the wall for 2014 and 2015. And then I start constructing yet another version of the course. Let me go back here so you can see the room again. I start constructing yet another version of the course here. We keep easels for the uh, enrollment information. And then this easel always carries what's going to happen next. At the moment, what's on it is our 
closing party from the end of June last year. We haven't yet decided what month we're going to be in this year, but um, uh, that's there. Now, this is our general uh, Nelly collage of all of our faculty members. And when you click on this, that gives you information. These are teleport boards that take you different places. And you can't quite see it, but that's coffee. <laughs> so if your avatar is thirsty, you can pick up a cup of coffee. So it's a it's a, a very interesting way of doing things, and it also allows you to build all kinds of stuff. And I really recommend that you go back and take a look at Nelly's um, Nelly's uh, YouTube channel, and you'll see here we have the 2017 uh, playlist, the 2016, the 2015, and the 2014. Um, on this one, I just put mine on, and I don't remember why, but the, these are all on Nelly's uh, network as well, on Nelly's YouTube channel. And you can see all the different types of courses that we've got. We've got people talking about how the University of El Paso has set up an area in Second Life so that the students can represent in a quote-unquote physical way the history and the activities that led to the foodways in, in Texas, that part of Texas where you had Native American Hispanic and Anglo um, Anglo American food food uh, uh, foods to grow foods to prepare different kinds of cultural relationships to food and it's all set out in a very beautiful way. You have links to um, uh, 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 the tour of the Hong Kong University set up into a whole variety of other. Um, cases and how to use virtual education for uh, virtual worlds for education, including worlds like um, worlds that are uh, uh, proprietary to individual institutions or schools, worlds that are in areas that are safer for students and so on. And then there's a lot of great information here. Um, the taxonomy of virtual world usage from St. Andrews. This one just gives you who's online in any virtual world that they're counting at any given moment, which is really wonderful. Any activity on the internet at all. The Horizon Project has recently pulled out of the New, Medium Consor New Media Consortium, put together the Horizon Project. They recently pulled out of Second Life. Um, they're no longer as interested in virtual worlds as they are in virtual, in augmented reality and other kinds of things. Um, but this is a very uh, good uh, uh, resource for this type of education. Um, the Journal of Virtual World Research, uh, which is an academic journal, the Virtual Education Journal, which is a journal of practice. Um, and then this is the International Society for Tech and Ed Virtual Environment Network. If you watch um, uh, the tour of their conference last year in the 2017 playlist, you'll see some of the things that are on the horizon. Then I have all the bibliography of articles that I read for this, this um, presentation, um, the version of it that I did last year, as well as retrieval information about all the various things on the pages. Some of them are really wonderful to go look at because it's a whole blog about that, that particular era in the history of virtual education. And then that's me, basically. So what I what my my evangel evangelist in me wants to tell you is that virtual worlds are not only an important place to develop education. Yes, it can be uh, a commitment of hours to get your site going and get information up there. It's also a wonderful place to do professional development. The Virginia Society for Tech uh, Technology and Education has uh, regular. Uh, uh, professional development lectures, there's discussion groups, there's ISTE, there's uh, the virtual pioneers who go all over Second Life seeing what's out there, there are installations on the Renaissance, there are all kinds of art galleries and museums, there's still a slew of universities that are there. Um, and then you have other worlds like DigiWorlds and InWorlds and OS Grid and the Grand Canada grid and then grids basically from all over the world that are focused on different types of uh, virtual world education. And the, obviously these are 24 seven kinds of operations. So you're going to run into people from other countries. When I'm on very early or very late, I'm bumping into Chinese folks and Japanese folks and people from Australia and Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, so you're, while you, the time zone is always a barrier, language may not be as much of a barrier given that it, barrier, given that there are international, uh, international language translators around you get 
a kind of a Google translation of what people are talking about. But there's lots of things that you can go and visit where people have lovingly created historical landmarks or current landmarks from their countries. And you, if you can't get to Saudi Arabia to see a grand mosque or Germany to see the Cathedral of Cologne or Jalisco in Mexico to see the railroad um, and so on, you can do that in these virtual worlds. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, fraught with potential kind of environment to teach in. So that's me, Nellie. Sorry for racing so, so quickly. Uh, that was great. Um, loved it. But you know what I managed to find? I mean, you'll see it later on in the chat box. I found all the playlists from 19... 19 from 2014 <laughs> from 2014 until 2017 did i miss something 2014 nope. 15 16 17 That's so we're awesome. going to be in our fifth year uh, yes. it's going to be vw vw uh, mooc 18 yes. Yes, we're changing it to virtual MOOCs, uh, virtual virtual world MOOC, VW VW 2018. MOOC 18. Yeah. And so on look my for that. Yeah, and on my on my uh, slideshow, I have all of those four four links as well. So everything oh, on oh, yep. It. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, basically just go to, just go to Nellie's, you know, Nellie's uh, YouTube channel is the, the center of the universe and look for anything that has MOOC in the playlist. And there is tons of stuff. And not only are there these wonderful lectures by all these different people, but there is also onboarding information, how to get an avatar, what you need technologically, how you learn your skills, where you can get your clothes. <laughs> So oh, tours of, of, of Manhapak and uh, Chilvo, lectures I've done, lectures other people have done, our dances and, you know, because you got to dance, you got to eat in virtual worlds. I'm sorry. <laughs> and what I also found, you can download your PowerPoint directly right now. I grabbed oh, it from, yeah, it worked. Uh, I grabbed it from uh, oh, Moodle. Great. And anybody can uh, download it. You see Fort's download, and they can have it right now. I should have started that at the beginning, but I just learned about it now that you can do it. So that's well, Moodle for you. Great. Yeah, exactly. And if you go if you go into Second Life and you get yourself to the SL MOOC headquarters, you can search for it in the destination bar, or you can use the link that's actually on my little final slide, I have, I think, oh no, I, that's me, I have a link to me. But you can look for integrating technology and this building link will come up. If you walk around that neighborhood, you'll find the Chilbo Public Library and the library is full of uh, links to books about virtual worlds and virtual world education. So that's another place where you can get more information. And, and this woman, Sue Gregory, who's from a consortium on virtual education uh, from Australia and New Zealand, um, has done some wonderful research with her collaborators. Anything that she's written is absolutely amazing. And a lot of these articles lead you to a lot of other things. The journals themselves are still publishing on the use of virtual worlds and now augmenting reality, which is um, a huge thing as well for schools that have that kind of, that have uh, that kind of funding. So, um, it's just a, it's a and it's the same thing as being a teacher in a regular classroom when you build that syllabus the first time you use that syllabus uh, going forward and edit it for the next one and the next one and the next one everything can be copied and pasted from Word doc so your your faculty can provide you with the information you need and then there's lots of ways to concretize your um, uh, learning activities so that the students can interact with them as avatars and also build things to represent their assessment project. I've been to a lot of kind of final exhibitions from courses on physics and um, physics and engineering and literature and art and technology from different schools around the country and around the world where there's a student standing by something that they built to represent a book that they were reading or something that gives you a book uh, a short story that they wrote um, and you can sit and chat with them about it and so on and they're uh, sitting in their homes or in a computer lab uh, you know thousands upon thousands of miles away chatting with you about what they did for that course and for their grades so it's a it's a great leveler I wanted to say that um, 
Eba and others who are interested in presenting, just as they would in CO18, oh. to present in July uh, through Second Life. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's not so that Ebba, because Ebba talked about, uh, Ebba's from Sweden. She talked about right. it open, I mean, not open, but learning spaces. And I think that that's an invitation uh, to everyone and to Judy, Judy Wong, who talked about yeah, you know, trying things out. Try it out. Okay. So we'll get Rob to also present, you know, <laughs> get I Rob. It's a great idea, and I, if, as you watch the things in the, in the if, as you watch the things in that playlist, you're going to see a lot of people sitting in a room with tons of avatars around and PowerPoint above them in the back, and they're just giving a lecture about what they want to do and what they research they've done. But then you're in that room with those people, and it's a very different. The co-presence makes a, a huge difference for distance education, and I want to say when you come into um, uh, Second Life, I'm Maggie Laramore because that was an era where you had to choose another name. Now you can use your own name and I'm, ugh, I've been there too long. <laughs> I don't change, although I think everybody knows who I am. Um, you can look for the Integrating Technology Building. Um, Nellie is Nellie Homewood in uh, Second Life and Doris Molero, our other co collaborator, is called Peony of Destiny in Second Life. So you can just get in touch with all of us and we would love to have more people um, presenting in world. It's a, it's a great experience. That's what we're going to do. That's what yeah. we're going to do. All and right. more people to come to the dances. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. All right. So thank you, Nan. Um, you got me.